Multivers, Story of a Conqueror, Chapter 1, Umbrella's Relic. In the Umbrella Surface Experimental Base, Alice lay unconscious on an operating table, connected to multiple syringes and sensors that monitored her vitals. Suddenly, the entire experimental building lost power, only to come back a few seconds later as the Red Queen took control. The Red Queen, an artificial intelligence program responsible for overseeing Umbrella's experiments, was designed to protect humanity. That's why she sealed the hive and killed those inside when the T-Virus was released by Spencer, to safeguard humanity from destruction. However, later Alicia Marcus uploaded a video into the Red Queen's mainframe, revealing the true intentions of Isaacs and other Umbrella higher-ups. They plan to create their own utopia using the T-Virus after destroying the current human civilization. This video caused a glitch in the Red Queen's decision-making, prompting her to free Alice, who could save the world and destroy Umbrella. Under the control of the Red Queen. Alice regained consciousness. Alice felt the pain of the syringes piercing her skin as she woke up. Ah! She removed all the syringes and sensors, quickly surveyed her surroundings, and realized she was in a locked room. Click. S-H-H-H-H-H. To her astonishment, one of the walls slid open, revealing a transparent case containing a short red dress and boots, the same attire she wore before being captured by Umbrella. Supporting her weak body, Alice approached the open compartment, retrieved the red dress and swiftly put it on. Click. As Alice donned the boots, another compartment in the wall opened, revealing a door leading to the outside world. Unaware of her location or the situation, Alice had no choice but to venture through the door and discover her circumstances on her own. Leaving the experiment room, Alice found herself in a long corridor enveloped in eerie silence. While she scanned her surroundings for signs of life or zombies, a nearby door opened as if beckoning her. It was the Red Queen's doing, she found a relic from Umbrella that might aid Alice. After some consideration, Alice moved toward the open door. Standing before the entrance, Alice cautiously inspected the room's interior to avoid any potential dangers, such as a lurking liquor. To her relief, she found nothing menacing, only an almost empty room with a cylindrical cultivation tank in the center, housing an unconscious man. When Alice saw the man inside the tank, she felt an inexplicable connection with him. Drawn to the slumbering man, Alice entered the room without hesitation and stood silently before the cultivation tank, observing him. The man possessed a captivating presence with a physique that appeared sculpted by the gods. His streamlined body exuded strength and grace, complemented by chiseled features and a handsome face that immediately caught Alice's attention. His luxurious mane of sleek black hair framed his captivating visage, adding an air of mystery and allure. As Alice observed the man, his eyes suddenly opened, meeting hers. Simultaneously, cracks spread across the surface of the cultivation tank, culminating in an explosive rupture. Even in the face of the explosion, Alice remained motionless maintaining eye contact with the newly awakened man. Although her body urged her to move, her soul resisted, sensing that the man would never endanger her. And true to her intuition, the explosion caused her no harm, leaving her appearance untouched, even her hairstyle intact. A faint smile formed on Alice's lips, confirming the accuracy of her intuition. However, her expression swiftly shifted from astonishment to shock and surprise as she noticed the man levitating in the air without any support. Amidst Alice's astonishment, the man moved seemingly walking through the air. As he did, particles of light manifested around his body. With each step he took, the cultivation fluid vanished, replaced by clothing and boots. Eventually, his hair was tied in a ponytail using a rubber band. In just a few steps, the enigmatic man stood before her, dressed in a black t-shirt, military pants, and boots. Standing tall, his height surpassing Alice's by approximately 190 centimeters, he lowered his head to meet her eyes. Under her shocked and surprised gaze, he encircled her waist with his strong arm, drawing her closer to him. Alice rested her hands on his chest, feeling the firmness of his muscles. Observing Alice's astonishment, the man smiled, much to her shock. He leaned down and sealed her lips with his own. Initially taken aback by the sequence of events, Alice's mind gradually recovered from the shock of losing her first kiss. Her face reddened in embarrassment, but to conceal it, she actively engaged in the kiss, finding herself enjoying the moment. Their passionate kiss endured for three whole minutes ending only when the man realized Alice's breath had become shallow. Taking the initiative, he broke the kiss. Huff, huff. Alice took deep breaths, resting her head on the man's chest, listening to his heartbeat. Her breathing soon returned to normal, and she regained her composure. At that moment, the man gently cupped Alice's chin, lifting her face to meet his gaze filled with love and tenderness. He spoke to her, saying, My name is Alex, Alexander Star. From now on, you will belong to me my first queen. Let us conquer this world together. Thump, thump. Alice's heart began to race upon hearing these dominant words. Surprisingly, she felt no discomfort, only excitement. In that instant, Alice realized she had fallen in love with the man before her at first sight, and she would never be able to leave him. Chapter 2, Truck Hun and System. Like many other transmigrators, Alexander Starr was an orphan in his previous life, growing up in a local orphanage. 
Determined to live life on his own terms, Alex became a YouTuber during his high school years, focusing on reviewing games, anime, manga, comics, and movies. As the internet expanded worldwide, Alex's YouTube career stabilized, and his fanbase grew to the point where he could live independently. His life revolved around creating review videos, traveling around the world, and spending time with the kids at the orphanage where he had grown up whenever possible. Although Alex's life lacked the vibrancy that comes from having family or loved ones, it was still significantly better than the lives of many people on earth. However, this period of relative contentment didn't last long. At the age of 25, while traveling in a tramp, Alex suddenly lost consciousness. Upon awakening, he found himself in a hospital where the doctor delivered the devastating news that he had staged two brain cancer. It was the most heart-trenching moment of his life. Thankfully, Alex quickly emerged from his depression and decided against pursuing treatment due to financial constraints. For the next few years, Alex lived his life to the fullest, unrestrained by obligations or responsibilities, until the day he tragically died in a truck accident. In his final moments, as he was struck by the truck, Alex's mind was consumed by a single thought, if given another chance at life he would seize it with a million times more joy and fulfillment. Unbeknownst to him, the truck that hit him was the legendary truck gun, which happened to hear his thoughts. Discovering Alex's life experiences, truck gun uttered these words to him before his consciousness faded into darkness, what an unlucky child, living such a life, allow me to grant you another chance to fulfill the desires hidden deep within your heart, as an apology for hitting you. I will also provide you with a system to accompany you on your journey. These were the last words Alex heard before he died, his consciousness swallowed by darkness. When Alex regained consciousness once again, he found himself two days before his meeting with Alice. He discovered that he was inside a cultivation tank in Umbrella's surface experimental base. Shocked, he attempted to move his body, only to realize that he had no control over it. His soul was the only part of him that retained awareness. Ding! Conqueror system has been loaded. At that moment, the system bestowed upon him by Drakkan revealed its existence. System? What's happening? Alex asked himself. But it was the system that responded. Ding! The host was hit by Drakkan. The system proceeded to explain everything that had happened, how he met Drakkan, who gave him the system, which then brought him to this world in search of a compatible body, which was currently being modified to match his soul. I understand. So, the suitable body you found for me is this artificial body developed by Umbrella to perfectly match the T-Virus, which is still in the development stage. Alex inquired. Ding. Yes, host. In that case, how long will it take to modify this body? How much time remains before the second movie plot begins? Alex asked. Ding. Host. It takes two days to modify your body, just in time for Alice's awakening at the start of the second movie, in the room next to you. I see. Are there any beginner's packages available for me? Alex inquired. Ding. Host, they are in the system storage. Please open it yourself. Okay, please continue your work. Alex then summoned the word menu in his mind, and a system panel materialized in his consciousness. The panel had a simple design, featuring only seven options, status, life, combat, storage, task, achievement, and about system. For now, the status, life, combat, achievement, and task options were grayed out and unavailable due to his lack of a physical body. Alex opened the storage option, causing the layout of the panel to shift revealing a grid with a platinum chest. Opening the platinum chest, Alex discovered two items inside. Ding, host, congratulations on acquiring the perfect black light virus stock solution and the arc of embodiment. Before him lay a vial containing a deep blue liquid and a platinum ball of energy. The system transferred the relevant information about these items directly into Alex's mind. The perfect black light virus stock solution granted its user the ability to assimilate and perfect any genetic material, removing any defects or weaknesses to enhance oneself. The Ark of Embodiment was a form of lost magic that allowed the caster to materialize and utilize anything they could imagine, granting them incredible versatility both in and out of combat. The creations could range from everyday objects and weapons to complex living beings, each possessing unique properties. While this magic had certain limitations, its caster considered it invincible. Accepting the two rewards, Alex requested the system to integrate the perfect black light virus stock solution into his body and the Ark of Embodiment into his soul. With this accomplished, Alex opened the final option about system, which provided information about all the menu options. The status option contained several subcategories, physique, spirit, and energy. Each subcategory featured further divisions. The life option encompassed mathematics, literature, engineering, housekeeping, art, music, sports, and more. The combat option comprised weapon mastery, close quarter combat, magic, equipment, and more. The storage option offered unlimited storage space, including features such as auto-sorting, group storage, 
and time-space isolation. Items taken out of storage would retain the same condition as when they were stored. However, it was noted that the system couldn't store conscious humans or animals, only unconscious beings. The task option provided tasks tailored to Alex's situation, and upon completion, the system would reward him. The achievement option focused on the accomplishments Alex had achieved. These achievements encompassed battles, education, science, and daily life. Creating an achievement would grant Alex a lottery ticket as a reward from the system. Lastly, the system informed Alex that it was possible to unlock new features through task completion or achievement creation. After familiarizing himself with the system, Alex patiently awaited the completion of his body modification, spending most of his time sleeping or crafting weapons for future use, which he stored in the system storage. Two days later, the system finished modifying his body. With the integration of the perfect black light virus stock solution, the T-virus within his body was assimilated and evolved to perfection, blending with human DNA. Thus, the most handsome and strongest human on earth was born, possessing shinic powers such as telekinesis, which Alex would later use to break free from the cultivation tank during his encounter with Alice. Chapter 3, I Plan to Have a Harem While Alice was in a trance, thinking about how easily she had fallen in love with just one glance at Alex's godlike body, he checked the marks and wounds on her body. These were the result of forcefully removing the syringes and sensors that had been attached to various parts of her body. Coming out of her thoughts, Alice noticed his gaze and followed it to see the marks and wounds on her body. These. She wanted to say that the wounds were nothing, but Alex interrupted her. Here, let me heal them. Alex placed his hand above the wound on her arm and used his arc of embodiment to create healing magic. His hand glowed green, and Alice felt a brief itch at the sight of the wound. Within seconds, the wound completely healed leaving no marks. Alice looked at him in surprise as she witnessed the healing. Alex smiled at her and said, it's just one of the applications of my powers. Let's continue with the treatment. Show me the other wounded places, and I will heal them. You'll be even more beautiful after all the wounds on your body are healed. Alice blushed and showed him the other places on her body that needed healing. Observing her blush, Alex commented, you're cute, which made her even more embarrassed. They proceeded with healing her wounds. Is this the last one? Alex asked Alice, who was still blushing as he removed his hands from her breasts where the sensors had been attached. The sensors had been forcefully removed by her, causing her skin to swell. Why yes, let's go outside. Alice blushed, still feeling the warmth of his hands on her breasts. You're cute, Alex said, holding her hand as they left the place. Alex used his telekinesis-like sonar, sending shinic waves in all directions. After capturing the returning waves, Alex created a 3D map of the surroundings in his mind with the help of the Ark of Embodiment. Using the map, Alex quickly found the path leading to the outside world. Alex led Alice, holding her hand, while she looked at his face. He noticed her gaze and asked, What's wrong? Nothing. I just want to ask, who are you? Alice had been wanting to ask this question since she first saw him. She wanted to know why she felt attracted to him the moment she laid eyes on him. Without stopping, Alex replied, If it's you, then there's no problem. I can tell you as you will be my first wife from now on. Alice blushed when he called her his wife, but she controlled herself. She thought she had misheard something about being his first wife and refrained from asking, as she heard him continue speaking. It might be hard to believe, but my soul is not from this world. You can think of my home world as similar to this one, minus the Umbrella Company and T-Virus. In our world, some humans have the power to glimpse into other worlds while sleeping, and they share these experiences through novels, comics, movies, dramas, and so on. Everyone in our world knows that there are other worlds out there, so people started wondering if we could travel to these worlds. Alex paused and looked at Alice, who had a shocked and surprised expression on her face. After Alice absorbed all this information, Alex continued, everyone has been trying to find the answer to the question, and I was one of them. However, the difference between them and me is that I have found the answer, yes. Traveling to another world requires one to discard their physical body meaning only at the moment of death can one travel to another world when the soul and physical body separate. The probability of this happening is less than 0.0000000000001%. I was just lucky, after dying in my original world, my soul traveled to this world and occupied this body created by Umbrella, as it was the only body that matched my soul. In addition to this, I acquired a miraculous power during the transition and one of its applications is what I use to heal your wounds back in the room. Alex fell silent after explaining all this, waiting for Alice's reaction once she had processed everything. Alice, the protagonist of this world, quickly absorbed it all and looked at him with a complex expression. Seeing her expression, Alex stopped and cupped her cheeks with one hand, asking her, Why do you look so conflicted? Is it because I know your future? Alice nodded, feeling conflicted at the idea that the man in front of her already knew her future. She thought he liked her because he knew her future and not the Alice standing before him. She shared her thoughts with him, only to have him flick her head. Ouch! She rubbed her head, glaring at him, asking why. You silly girl, Alex said, 
placing his hand on her head and rubbing it, as if he were a parent concerned about his foolish child's future. Alice grew a little angry at his expression. What do you mean by that expression? Of course, I worry about you, who has a God-level brain supplement. When did I say I knew your future? What I knew was the future of one of the parallel universes of this world and the you in that parallel world. The future of everyone in this world, including you, has already started to change the moment I appeared here. And for your mental well-being, let me tell you, I like you not because I like the you whose future I know, but because you are here in front of me, the one I fell in love with at first sight. So, let go of all these tangled thoughts from your mind, because you will never be able to escape from me. I will love you. Remember these words in your heart and mind. Alex said all this while patting her head and embracing her with his other hand. Understood, Alex said, looking at her. Yes, Alice replied with a smile. But then, she remembered something, and her expression became uneasy. Alex also noticed her expression and asked, what happened? Why do you look like that? Alice looked at him and asked directly. I want to know what you mean by me being your first wife. Do you intend to accept other girls besides me? Well, that's exactly what I mean. I plan to have a harem, and you will be my first wife. Alex stated his intention directly, believing there was no need to hide such things from her when he had already decided to accept her into his family. Alice was momentarily speechless, and before she could say anything, Alex silenced her with a kiss, causing her to lose herself in the moment. After a minute, they separated. Alex looked at the girl in his arms and, with a mischievous smile, asked, I know it makes you uncomfortable, but please trust me. I don't intend to add random girls into our relationship. I will love each of them, but you will be my favorite among them all. Alice rested her head on his chest, feeling weak due to the lack of air. At that moment, Alex whispered in her ear, so, can you give me a chance, or shall I continue kissing you until you say yes? He blew warm air into her ear, making her body tremble. Alice quickly stood up and looked at his smiling face, which seemed devilish to her causing her to tremble. So, Alex asked her once again. I agree. Alice quickly agreed when she saw him lower his head. Okay, let's get out of here. We need to leave this city quickly. Alex held her hand, and they left the umbrella building. As they stepped outside, they encountered two zombies, whom Alex took care of with a gun he had created in the past two days. He gave one of the guns to Alice. Since the guns were equipped with silencers, they didn't attract other zombies, and they swiftly left the area in search of food. Chapter 4, Main Quest Drives. Here, eat this to replenish your strength. Alex told Alice, handing her a chocolate bar. Thanks. Alice took the bar from Alex and began eating. They were currently inside a mart not far from the umbrella building. They had come here in search of food to replenish their strength because they had encountered more than 20 zombies on their way, expending a lot of energy to kill them. This made them even hungrier than they already were. Sitting beside Alice, Alex opened a protein bar and started eating. While eating, he accessed the system panel in his mind, recalling the notification sound he had heard when he killed his first zombie in this world. He opened the system panel and found that all the previously grayed out options were now available. The combat and task options had notification marks on them. Switching to the task panel, Alex saw that the system had assigned a task to him. Main quest, survival, quest goal, successfully escape from Raccoon City, reward, system lottery 3x, system tips, the world of Resident Evil has begun. While it may be the start of an apocalypse for other people, for you, it is a chance to conquer this world. Your first step towards conquering this world is to survive the zombies and the upcoming nuclear bomb strike and escape the city, as expected. In an apocalyptic world, the system's first quest is related to survival, Alex said to himself. He then started devising a plan to smoothly leave the city. Closing the task panel, Alex opened the combat panel and saw that his marksmanship proficiency had increased to 30. After consulting the system, he learned that proficiency in any skill could be improved through repeated practice. Closing the combat panel, he opened the status panel to examine his strength, among other things. The panel didn't contain any names. Instead, it had categories such as physique, spirit, and energy, each with a value of 100 slash 100 slash 200, 10 times that of an average human. Each category had several subcategories. Physique subcategories, arm strength, leg strength, muscle density, bone density, flexibility, stamina, etc. Spirit subcategories, soul strength, soul perception, soul concentration, reaction speed thinking speed, etc. Energy subcategories, shinik, energy reserve, control, manipulation range, and mana, energy reserve, control, manipulation range. After learning more about himself, Alex decided to test if the amount of mana used by Ark of Embodiment would differ based on his level of knowledge about the object. He wanted to confirm if creating the same thing, knowing its details or not, would consume the same amount of mana. To conduct the experiment, Alex first created a Beretta 92 gun without detailed information which cost him 10 points of mana. Then, he imagined the details of the Beretta 92 gun that he knew from his previous life as a gun enthusiast. This time, it only cost him 5 points of mana, less than half of the previous time. From this experiment, 
Alex learned that the more detailed concept he had in mind about what he conjured up, the less mana he would use. With this newfound knowledge, Alex decided to create now magic, analyze from the world of in another world with my smartphone. Creating this magic, he took out the gun from his storage, which he had obtained from the corpse of a police officer they had encountered before, and used analyze magic on it. The moment Alex used this magic, his mana decreased by one point, and a large amount of detailed information about the gun's structure and the elements it was made of, etc., appeared in his mind. Having a brain ten times more active than an average human, Alex quickly absorbed all the information. He then used that information to create the same gun, consuming only three points of mana and completing the creation in half the time. Learning more about his powers, Alex stored all the guns he had created in his storage. Then he created a bracelet with the effect of collecting mana from the surroundings to store inside itself. It could store around 1000 points of mana and provided a mana, shenic energy regeneration buff for himself. All in all, it cost him 70 points of mana leaving him with only 101 points, which quickly increased after he wore the bracelet. While doing all this, Alex noticed that Alice had been looking at him with a smile on her lips. What happened? He asked. Nothing. I was just looking at your face. So, what were you doing creating all those copies of the two guns? Alice asked him, and Alex explained the results of the experiment to her. So, the more detailed information you have about the things you want to create, the less time and energy you will consume. That's great. So, can you create anything? Alex noticed a hopeful expression in Alice's eyes and instantly knew what she was thinking. Not everything. I can't create completely unknown things, nor can I create things that require more energy than I have. So, sorry, I can't create the antidote for this virus, Alex said, patting her head as she sighed upon hearing his answer. I know, Alice said, shaking her head to reset her mood. Focusing her mind, she stood up and, while looking at Alex, said, let's go. Okay, but before that, let me pack some supplies, Alex said as he also stood up. With a wave of his hand, everything in a radius of 10 meters around him disappeared as he stored them all in his storage. He then categorized the items and returned the empty furniture using the auto-sort feature of the storage. He repeated this process a few more times, emptying the entire shop. Turning to face Alice, he said, it's more beneficial to take all of them with us. They will only rot in this place anyway. Let's go. Knowing that Alex was right, Alice nodded and said, Okay. After leaving the store, Alex noticed a Yamaha V-Max parked by the side of the road. Seeing the bike, a light flashed in Alex's eyes as he remembered it as the one Sabah used in the Fourth Holy Grail War. Looking at Alice, Alex pointed at the bike and asked, Alice, would you like to ride that bike? Which one? Alice looked in the direction Alex was pointing, saw the bike, and nodded. Why not? That's a cool looking bike. Okay. Then it's decided. We are going to ride that one. Alex took Alice near the bike, finding it locked. Alex handed his gun to Alice used analyze magic on the bike, and created a key to unlock it based on the information he received. Seeing Alex use magic to create the key to unlock the bike, Alice's mouth twitched as she thought, if Alex wants, he can be the best thief in the world. Unaware of Alice's thoughts, Alex sat on the bike and, after creating a soundproof barrier around them to avoid attracting zombies, he looked at Alice, who seemed lost in thought. He said, Alice, what are you thinking? Let's go. Ah. Yes. Alice quickly sat behind him and hugged his waist as Alex accelerated the bike. So, where are we going? Alice asked. I thought of collecting some more supplies. Can you point me to some marts, everyday shops, and gun shops in the area to replenish our stock and find weapons and ammunition for protection? Alex answered. Alice agreed with Alex's plan and recalled the nearby marts, malls, everyday shops, and gun shops. She then guided Alex to the nearest gun shop. Chapter 5, Disparate Situation. Half an hour later. Alex and Alice were seen riding their bikes around the town. In the past half hour, with Alice guiding the way, Alex raided two smart marts, a big mall, and two gun shops. In one of the gun shops, they even found a semi-automatic machine gun, which Alex now had in his storage along with a set of them. Currently, they were heading towards the school where Angie Ashford, Dr. Ashford's daughter, studied. Alex's plan was to find the girl first and then wait for the doctor to contact them, as he believed the doctor would provide them with a means to escape the city. While thinking about all this, Alex suddenly noticed a horde of zombies ahead on the road. They were surrounding a church not far away, blocking the road due to their large numbers. As Alex glanced at the church surrounded by zombies, a sense of familiarity struck him. He remembered it as the same church where the female police officer Jill, her friend Peyton, and the journalist Terry had taken refuge. It was the place where they had met Alice in the movie. Just as Alex was contemplating these thoughts, Alice, sitting behind him, pulled out the two machine guns he had given her and began shooting at the zombies without hesitation. She knew that Alex had created a sound barrier around them, ensuring that her actions wouldn't attract the zombies' attention. While Alice dealt with the zombies, Alex utilized his shenic powers to scan the interior of the church. He discovered four signs of life inside. Alice, there are four people inside the church. Do you want to save them? Alex asked Alice, 
realizing that his decision to save them wouldn't impact him directly. Surprised by the revelation, Alice quickly regained her composure and asked Alex, Can we save them? Alice, like Alex, didn't have a strong emotional attachment to strangers' lives as long as they weren't acquaintances. In the movie, she had been searching for survivors because she was alone. However, the situation had changed now that she had Alex with her, and her focus was solely on him. Thus, she sought Alex's opinion, aligning her answer with his. Alex felt somewhat helpless in that moment. He hadn't expected Alice to support his decision. However, the question remained, should he save them or not? In that moment, Alex remembered the actress who played Jill in the movies. If he remembered correctly, she was beautiful and attractive. With that in mind, Alex decided to save the woman, envisioning her as a potential addition to his family, providing Alice with a sister. This decision aligned with his promise to himself in his previous life, to live his second life without regrets, including the absence of love and family. Building a harem and having children were things he considered for the future. With these thoughts in his heart, Alex told Alice, Okay, let's save them. Okay, Alice responded, got off the bike and continued shooting at the zombies. Alex stored the bike in the storage and took out two machine guns like Alice. However, these machine guns were slightly different. Alex had enhanced their magazine storage space, increasing their capacity by a thousand times. He had done the same with Alice's machine gun. It had consumed a significant amount of his mana, but the result was worth it. Let's dance, Alex said, joining Alice in shooting at the zombies. As they fought, his marksmanship proficiency steadily increased, gaining one point for every two zombies he killed. Meanwhile, inside the church, Jill, Peyton, and Terry had just discovered that the priest's sister had turned into an undead creature. The priest had been feeding her living humans. Are you feeding her? Jill asked the priest, pointing her gun at him while his sister, now a zombie, protected him. She hasn't been affected. She's just ill. Ah, just as the priest tried to explain, their zombie sister broke free from her restraints and bit her brother's neck. What are you doing? I'm your brother. The priest shouted at his sister, only to be bitten to death by her. Bang, bang. Jill quickly fired two shots killing both the priest and his sister. Let's go. The gunfire must have attracted the attention of the zombies, Jill told her friend and the reporter. They agreed and followed Jill towards the entrance of the church. S-H-H-G-G-G-H-H-H-H. As they reached the church hall, they heard a sound from above. What's that? Peyton asked. It's coming from above, Jill replied, shining her torch towards the ceiling. Rua, the light from Jill's torch illuminated a mutated humanoid creature crawling on the ceiling. It had elongated limbs, a skeletal frame and a hunched posture. Its pale skin revealed the exposed brain, with its eye sockets covered by a layer of skin. It possessed a long, prehensile tongue. It was a liquor, which flicked its tongue like a whip as soon as the light fell upon it. Ugh! Terry screamed in horror at the sight of the liquor. Bang! 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 Jill quickly shot at the liquor, but it moved with incredible speed and evaded the bullets before she could fire. What was the thing? Some kind of monster from the movies? Peyton asked in a state of terror. Be careful. It's very fast and can attack from anywhere. Jill warned Peyton and Terry. Did that thing have a tongue? Did you see? It was like a barbed wire, Peyton muttered fearfully. Thud, it's coming. Jill shouted as they heard the sound of the liquor hitting the ground. Bang, bang. Pulling Terry to her side, Jill fired a few shots towards the area where they had heard the liquor fall. Unbeknownst to them, there were originally two liquors, not just one. The other liquor had remained silent, allowing them to focus on the one creating noise. It waited for the opportune moment, when the group was cornered in a desperate situation. As Jill fired for the second time and caught everyone's attention, the hidden monster shot its tongue like a whip towards Peyton who was closest to it. Ugh! The liquor wrapped its tongue around Peyton's right leg, successfully pulling him between the benches and breaking his neck, killing him instantly. Bang! Bang! No! Peyton! Jill and Terry reacted, but it was already too late. The liquor had dragged Peyton between the benches. If you like this audiobook, subscribe the channel for more videos like this. Please like, share, and leave a comment on the video.